All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, Marte. How are you? Hello, Crystal. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you all for joining us. Um, here we're going to be starting off our first solar presentation. This is our first of many solar workshops we hope to be doing, and we have the wonderful Crystal here to guide us through. So, today on our panel, we have co founder and director Baron Roth <laughs> and Crystal Group Hugs founder. I am my Ortiz, workshop coordinator, and we'll be introducing solar energy through Crystal's amazing company. Can't wait. <laughs> Let's look at today's schedule. So the workshop will consist of a brief introduction to circular economy manufacturing, and we'll update you on the newest of news on our micro factory and the production. Then Crystal will take it away with her solar energy presentation, and we'll have some time at the end where you can drop all your questions in the comments, and we'll answer for you at the very end of the workshop. I'll now pass the virtual microphone over to Baron Roth. Thanks, Maite. So our company is Circular Economy Manufacturing. Thanks for joining us in this format, whether you're watching um, on a video recording or listening on a podcast. Uh, we appreciate you all uh, joining and hope you learn a lot uh, from today's presentation. I've actually seen Crystal give this presentation twice, uh, if that's good. <laughs> Uh, I brought my daughter to it uh, one time. She loved it, um, and I, I hope you'll get it uh, as much out of it as I did, and you'll have the ability to go back and listen to it over again. Uh, very quickly, before we get to Crystal, I'll just give you some updates on our company. We are a new startup creating a solar-powered portable microfactory, which for the video audience uh, is on the screen now. It takes single-use plastic and shreds it, puts it in a rotational mold, and turns it into long-lasting, durable products, all using solar power. So we've had workshops on plastic recycling, and we've had uh, our first product is a compost bin. So we've had workshops on composting, but because our whole operation is solar-powered, we thought we would love it if we could get Crystal to come and give a, uh, her solar uh, introduction because it uh, was so, uh, I think, informative and, uh, and really puts it in, uh, puts the, the information um, in terms we can all relate to. So um, I'll show you a quick update. Our process deals with the technical cycle. So for those that are familiar with the circular economy, you know that as a sustainable business, we try and design everything with uh, into either a technical cycle where it's recycling, glass, metal, plastic, or a biological cycle like food, plants, wood. Well, our process deals with the technical cycle. Our first product is a compost bin dealing with the biological cycle and we'll be uh, launching soon on Kickstarter uh, where Crystal got her uh, start and uh, one of the many ways in which she has inspired us uh, in our ventures is that she launched on Kickstarter. So we're going to do the same. If you go to our page and, and click on the pledge um, button, you'll get, you'll, it'll take you to a page that looks something like this. So stay tuned for that. Um, and we'll, we'll have more uh, updates about our uh, food scrap collection then soon. Uh, I recently returned from our micro factory in California where I met with our engineers, Andrew and Mark, um, brilliant guys, both uh, uh, incredibly smart. Ro Mark is a rocket scientist who uh, loves solving um, problems that people say can't be solved and, and that's perfect for our company. So um, he's been cranking out uh, samples this week um, and I thought I'd show uh, what our micro factory looks like and a short little video clip here. So that is, that's so cool. <laughs> it's, it's pretty awesome uh, to see it finally coming together. It's been an idea for so long. So to see it like finally uh, in fruition is 
is pretty great. And uh, fresh out of the mold are uh, five different colored samples that we, we got yesterday. So we're super excited about it. Um, and, and when it comes out to Governor's Island, we'll be installing the solar panels and the battery and all of the electrical. So uh, with that, um, we thought, you know what, it's time to get a, a solar expert. Uh, and, uh, and so we're super excited to have Crystal um, share that workshop with you tonight. Crystal and I met working at a uh, co-working space in, in Brooklyn and was always seeing her making these cool little solar <laughs> contraptions. I was like, I have to just ask what is going on here. So um, got to know her uh, through that co-working space and stayed connected. Uh, they have been an inspiration uh, as a sustainable company, as a company, you know, as a startup, you know, kind of making it on their own through Kickstarter. And then continue to inspire us through workshops like like this, uh, and kind of following um, uh, the model that they put forward. And so, great to be able to have her come. And uh, I have to say, if you haven't gotten one, get one of your group hug solar <laughs> chargers from her because uh, they're they're awesome. Um, my daughter uh, loves it, and I, I think it kind of uh, makes it real rather than this abstract thing. So. Um, I don't want to talk anymore. I'll let Crystal take it uh, from here. So great. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. It, I, it's hard to believe that I think we probably met in like 2018 at ADO. And yeah. I just feel like the past, I mean, the past two years, like don't count, I feel like. So I feel like it was, <laughs> yeah. like it was just last year, but it wasn't, but it wasn't, it wasn't really. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I love doing this workshop. I think I'm an educator. I know, uh, Barrett, you didn't mention this word, but also both teachers. So we've critiqued right. each other's right. classes. Um, but right. I, I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah um, but, yeah, but yeah, I, I love it. That's right. Yeah. I know, <laughs> pandemic. I also think it's summer. So I'm like, I don't teach um, yeah, right. exactly. until it's like September again. But, but yeah, I'm excited to do it. I, I, um, well, um, let's see. Can can everybody see my slides yet? Excellent. I'll, I will get right into it. Awesome. And I will say this presentation is pretty interactive, so I'll pause and ask questions. So Baron and Maite, feel free feel free to jump in. Awesome. Um, so a quick introduction. Hello, my name is Crystal. I'm the founder and CEO of Group Hug Solar. Um, Today, what I'm going to talk about a bit of an intro of, of what Group Hug is, what my background is. Um, I am new to solar design, but I, I think it's something that anyone could get into, which I'll talk about. We'll talk about the basics of electricity, the basics of solar panel, and then we'll have a discussion at the end. So a quick intro to me, um, again, Crystal, I'm an industrial designer by trade. I went to Georgia Tech and studied industrial design. I'm also a teacher at SBA in New York, um, the New Jersey Institute of Technology and Parsons. I'm, I used to work, I actually used to design toys for a living. Um, I was, I'm the former director of product design at Little Bits, and I've done some residencies um, around New York at the New Museum, at the New York Hall of Science, and at Kickstarter, which uh, Barrett mentioned. So a little bit about Group Hug. Um, actually, Barrett showed, showed the product, um, which is a window solar charger, which I'll talk about, but I, I really got into solar about three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, because I sort of woke up one day and was like, oh, just cli you know, climate anxiety. I'm not really focusing on, on the environment in my job and I really wanna make a difference. And I love technical things, I love building things. And I was really attracted to solar as a technology. So I was like, oh, well, I'll, I'll just get solar in my apartment. And then I realized like, oh, it's actually kind of difficult to get solar in your apartment because I don't live in a house or a condo that looks like this. Um, I live in an apartment building like this. So how I was really sparked by this frustration of like, this isn't fair. Like, what can I, what can I personally do? And I figured there were other people who might feel similar. Um, the, the other thing that really caught my eye about solar is that um, it's not always the most attractive. Um, a lot of personal solar panels are designed for people who like camping and fishing and hiking, which is not me. Um, like I would, I love solar, I would not wear those backpacks. And I, I just thought there was like an element of, of design um, and detail missing from the current solar panels on the market. So I thought to myself, well, I want to make a solar panel that looks like it could be in a museum, in an art museum, that looks like it could be in, in an anthropology catalog, something like that. And this is actually one of, 
one of the early prototypes of the Windows Solar Charger. This is my husband. Um, I made he was our he was our model for the first two years of the company. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be scrappy. Um, I love showing this picture in my talks because this is a picture of the first commercial solar panel ever made in the 50s um, in New Jersey by um, by Bell Labs. And I, I, when I was doing my research before I started the company, I really sort of like laughed when I saw this picture because solar panels, if this picture were in color, like solar panels look almost exactly the same today. It's basically a rectangle like slapped on a pole and that's basic, that's what we do today. And I, I, I found that so in, uh, kind of frustrating but inspiring because there's so much potential in what they could look like. Mm -hmm. So from that, I, I got to, as a designer, I got to sketching and working immediately, just thinking about, you know, how could we make this look different? How could we make it look like stained glass, like art, like something people want to see and not sort of an eyesore? So from there, I sort of honestly, I watched a lot of YouTube videos. I talked to as many experts that would talk to me about how solar panels are made, how solar cells are made, which we're going to talk about. I bought a, a bunch of solar cells and like, like Barrett probably saw me. I just like was tinkering and like trying to make stuff in the beginning and trying to figure out how the cell works. Um, these are some pictures of early early prototypes. I think I made all of these at ADO actually. I was gonna um, say this looks like ADO's. Um, the the black mats, yeah. yeah. I made all of them at ADO. Uh, this is actually outside of ADO. You can see the corner. You can well, see the corner, yeah, exactly. the corner of the street right there. Um, and I I um, I think just being more hands-on and, and figuring out how to really approach solar from the lens of a designer and change the way they look. Um, so from there, um, we, like Barrett said, we launched on Kickstarter in, let's see, June 2019 with a first product called the Window Solar Charger designed to give people that live in apartments a hands-on way to get involved with solar, learn about it, and practically charge their USB devices off the grid. So there's there's a built-in battery here, there's a USB port, um, and we're, we're working on some new, some new versions, and I'll show you guys some pictures. Um, in the past few years, we've sold um, thousands, which has been really exciting. Um, I love getting pictures from people from all over the country, lots of, lots of cat pictures. This one is one of my favorites. It's someone powering a record player with, with the panel, which is great. For, like during Christmas time, it's like a Mariah Carey record, which I thought was really exciting. Um, and I, it just never gets old seeing them, seeing them out in the wild and having it be someone's first step into solar. Oh, that's awesome. In, oops, in 2020, um, I was lucky enough to go on Shark Tank and pitch an intimidating panel of sharks. Um, <laughs> we did get an investment from Mark Cuban. So he's our first and, and only investor in Group Hug right now, which is very, wow. very exciting. And one th this is the last thing that I'll say about Group Hug, and then I'll, I'll dive into the science part. Um, one of the crazier things we've done is we not only make these small window solar chargers, but since we sort of have gone through the process of designing solar panels from scratch, we realized that solar panels can really be in any any shape you want. And this is a cat-shaped solar panel called Solar Cat that lives at the New York Hall of Science. And it's an interactive um, interactive exhibit powered by Solar Cat itself. Um, awesome. So anything is possible. If anyone listening wants <laughs> to be a solar panel designer, there's a ton of opportunities. Okay. And then to end here, I think, I think, you know, similar to this circular economy manufacturing, like the future of energy and the future of products needs more creativity. I think it's not just about utility anymore. Um, really thinking about the way the life cycle of something, how it looks, how it makes you feel. And that's really sort of the approach that we take to solar. Okay, so we'll start off here. And this is sort of like a rehashing of like your fifth grade science class. Mm -hmm. um, but you you would be surprised how, um, you know, how many people don't, there's, uh, I don't know how to say this, there's so many systems that revolve in our world that just happen and we don't really think about them. So you'd be surprised how much of this stuff happens all around you, but you don't realize. So first we're going to talk about where does electricity come from? So if you closed your eyes, you'd probably be like here, the outlets, but how does it actually get to the outlets is what we're going to talk about. And how electricity actually gets to your outlets was a huge controversy in the 1880s, um, a battle between AC and DC, which is called the Battle of the Currents. Um, 
so I always like to tell people like everyone knows of ACDC as like a, a heavy metal band, but it actually means something. Um, alternating current and direct current. There was a big battle between two people about would alternating current or direct current lay the foundation for our modern electricity grid, how it gets made at power plants and then sent to the outlets in our home. So the, the battle was between these two men. They purposefully don't have names here. Um, do you guys want to guess? Can you identify who these two people are? I, I'm this <laughs> workshop, so I'm gonna I'm gonna keep quiet. <laughs> Maite, you're on the I spot. I wanna I wanna say one of them is Tesla, maybe. Okay. One. Do you know who the other one is? No. Okay. So you're right. We've got Nikola Tesla on this side and Thomas Edison on this side. So he went on to found GE, huge inventor. Um, so one of these people, uh, these were the two men battling for basically how the grid was going to be set up to electrify America. Which one of these men do you think won, Maite? Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Okay. It was Tesla. Um, and you're not alone. This happens in every workshop. Everyone always says Edison because I think you... Um, you just like recognize his name as being this big inventor, but it was actually Tesla won the battle of how the grid is set up. Um, he didn't do it alone. I always like to say that he worked with like this big railroad magnet, George Westinghouse. There's a lot of history and there's movies about this. So if you're interested, Google battle of the currents and you can learn all about it. So Tesla was an advocate for alternating current AC. Thomas Edison was an advocate for direct current DC. Um, Thomas Edison actually made the first DC power grid that could only basically light up a block in New York City called Pearl Street Station. So if you ever come to New York and go on Pearl Street, there's actually a little sign sign about about the first first uh, first grid in New York. Anyways, um, the the alternating current and direct current. I know those can sound like kind of abstract words. One way to think about them. So you have to imagine 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 electricity. However, that looks in your head as you imagine it. Um, alternating current is sort of, when I say alternating, it alternates between positive and negative. So if, if you think about magnets having a positive and negative pole, just think about a, a current going from positive to negative, which creates this wave. And it can go at much higher, uh, higher current, current and like voltages, and it can go longer distances because it can be higher. Direct current tends to be lower power and it only goes in one direction so it goes you know flows in one direction it's not doing this wavy thing but because it's not as powerful it can't go as far so those were the those were the two main differences between ac and dc um ac tesla ended up winning this battle like i just mentioned and the reason why that was more of the winning concept, if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, direct current couldn't go that far. So like I mentioned, Thomas Edison had um, made a power plant in New York, but it could only power one block. Um, that would mean we would have these big power plants integrated into the city, um, which we don't want because of obviously from these pictures, all of the pollution and, and bad effects that it has. So they were most power plants are built pretty far from where people live, not in every case, but typically like you know, a hundred miles away from where you live. And all of that power gets sent through the power grid back to where you need to go. So if you were to guess what percentage of energy generated in the US do you guys think is just from renewable energy? So not just solar from wind, solar, any other type of renewable. Um, I wanna say B. 34%, although I'm hopeful it's 40, 52. <laughs> okay. Barrett, do you want to guess? I don't know if you remember this part. Um, I think it's not as high as that. I'm going to go lower. It's C. Yeah. It's yeah, I was, be, I was being hopeful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, when you said 52, I was like, <laughs> ooh, that's really hopeful. Um, so <laughs> we, we've, got a long, we've got a long way to go. And I, I always like showing this because sometimes it feels like on the news or on the internet, you're seeing all this stuff about renewable energy. But when, we, when you actually look at the numbers, we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, what percentage out of the 100% that powers the US do you think is from just solar energy, if you were to guess? Out of the renewables? No, out of all, out of all energy. Oh, out of all energy. Yeah. 
I want to say 10%. 10%? Okay. I'm lower than that. Yeah. <laughs> 2%. <laughs> no. It's really low. I mean, this number is growing rapidly year over year, but it is it is pretty low. Um, if you're ever interested in, like, learning about these numbers, you can actually um, – you can usually sort by where you live too. EIA.gov is a great resource to, to, to learn about to learn about all of this stuff. There was a good okay. piece in the, in the Times recently that had uh, maybe sometime in the pandemic, so who knows when that was. <laughs> but uh, but it, you could search and it would create little visuals of uh, how much wind energy and solar and so oh cool i have to look that up over time like iowa suddenly has become and and illinois when i go back you know full of wind turbines which yeah is awesome so yeah. so yeah it's interesting how much it's changed even in the last five years definitely yeah it, it's definitely i think coming to like a peak where people are realizing that it just makes sense to switch um yeah. So we, we talked about the history of the grid, kind of who was involved, how it was decided. Now, how do power plants actually generate electricity? And typically you can describe it sort of in one word, which I like to say spinning. Um, and I, I think when you're driving or if you, know, if you see pictures of power plants, you just see it with like the smokestacks, but not everyone realizes like what happens inside. So I'm gonna break that down for you. And all of this will be a good foundation for you to understand how solar works and why it's so different and and um, better for the environment to do it that way. So um, I won't talk about like how a turbine works, but essentially if, if you, Brent just mentioned wind turbines, if you think about a wind turbine, how that actually creates electricity is you have like a little, uh, uh, it's a, it could also be called a turbine, a dynamo, if anyone has ever had like a dynamo light on their bicycle, but it's a, it's a coiled copper wire with magnets. And when that spins, it causes electrons to move and create electricity. Electricity is when electrons move. And then you basically have wires that take that electricity and route it to where it needs to go. So you can imagine like something like this that's in the middle of that turbine with the blades. Um, we're gonna talk about something like that. So when we're talking about power plants, there's obviously different kinds. Um, I threw up a few examples here. So um, let's um, let's say I'm going to just take coal for as, as an example because it's very common. So in any power plant, you start off by burning something. You can burn coal. You can burn natural gas. You can do nuclear fission, which you're not burning, but you're doing it to create heat. It's like a, an efficient way to create heat. You can burn biomass that you, you wanna burn something to create heat and that heat heats water and that water generates steam. You might know where I'm going. Above the steam, the steam spins a turbine and that's what actually generates the power. You can kind of think of a little wind turbine. That power gets sent over the grid via alternating current. So think of Tesla and it can go far distances without losing a lot of efficiency. That grid reaches your home through your sockets. Um, different um, different countries have different standards. Like we're two twenty, uh, two twenty. Europe is has different standards, so um, not all grids are created exactly the same. Then, obviously, when it reaches your home, this says mobile, but you can charge any device. You can power anything by plugging it into your into your socket. So you can. Hopefully this gives you like a, a visual diagram of all of the things that need to happen to generate this electricity. Before I dive into solar, I always like talking about this because it like blows some people's mind. Um, everyone has, I don't have one right now, but everyone has like a little, um, I always call it like the little white block, that little white block or black block or whatever type of phone you have. I, I have an iPhone, so that's why mine's white, um, is called an AC adapter. And that's because um, small mobile devices, anything with a battery in it typically runs on DC energy, so direct current. And you can think about it, you know, my the electricity in my phone is not traveling very far, right? It's a battery, it's going to the circuit, that's it. Um, so this little block, its purpose is taking the electricity from the grid, which is, which is alternating current, and converting it 
to DC energy. That's why it's an AC adapter. If you think about, let's see. So here's, here's my computer charger. This block is an AC adapter for a computer because my computer runs on DC energy. The grid is AC. It has to go through these wires, convert, and before it hits my computer. So um, that's something that I feel like we're all used to these like chunky blocks and we don't really know why. That's why it's, it's, it's literally converting between the two types of electricity. So now that I get, now I'm going to get into solar, solar basics. So um, we, all, we all know what solar panels look like. Um, this is a very idyllic home with, with solar panels on the roof. Um, since, we, since you guys now know how power plants work, there are no moving parts in solar panels, um, which is huge. If you think about a lot of other renewable energy sources like turbines, power plants, which are basically based on turbine technology, there's a lot of moving parts um, into that. And um, solar panels are very efficient. If you ever hear that solar panels are very clean, like clean energy, they, they don't have any, any moving parts. There's no emissions, nothing like that. Um, I, I like showing this picture again, just because it gives you guys some more context that um, this is a like marketing tagline that was written in the 50s, something new under the sun. It's the Bell Solar Battery made of thin disks of specially treated silicon, an ingredient in common sand. It converts the sun's rays directly into usable amounts of electricity, simple and trouble free. So that's that's them marketing solar, solar panels in the 50s. Wow. <laughs> hasn't changed a whole lot since then. And um, I mean, it's, I, I would actually be, I would love to be a fly on the wall for, from people like reading this in the fifties, if it was like mind blowing or how, how they yeah. took it. <laughs> yeah. I remember the first solar installation in my neighborhood and people were like, wow, that's crazy. You know? Yeah. Like, or you like, know, it doesn't, like it doesn't was... make sense. Like the cost doesn't make sense. And yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. So now the science behind solar. So um, some basic vocabulary to know about solar, just because um, I don't want to say a lot of a lot of words that don't make sense. Um, solar cells are the pieces that make up a solar panel. So if you see a solar panel and you'll see like little squares or little rectangles, those are solar cells. And then multiple solar panels make up a solar array. So if you've ever seen um, solar ar solar arrays um, kind of in lawn, uh, grass, lawns, um, open spaces, or a solar array on a roof. So you'll, you'll hear me say those three things and that's, that's what I'm talking about. So solar cells, so I've got some. Usually if this was in person, Barrett knows, I'll, I would hand these out so you guys could see them. These are some little solar cells that I just have on my desk. These are made out of silicon, so not silicone, silicon, the element. Um, and I'm sure if, if you've ever watched Silicon Valley or you've heard the term Silicon Valley, meaning that area in California where all the startups are, um, that is actually because um, back in the 60s and 70s, Silicon Valley became Silicon Valley because there was a lot of startups um, working and innovating in the microchip and like microcontroller space which is this little guy right here that goes on circuit boards. And that was such a huge um, innovation because it allows you to process um, more power, more data, more efficiently. And silicon is a very smooth surface that allows you to do that with very, very little uh, imperfections. And that's also one of the reasons why they're used in solar panels because they, they tend to be more efficient at transferring and capturing that electricity. Um, when you, if you, so here's a solar cell. If I turn it sideways, you guys can see that it's extremely thin. Um, I have a huge bucket of these, so don't feel bad. But I mean, it it breaks similarly to like a potato chip. Um, they're very, very fragile, very, very thin. But if you zoomed into right here and tried to look at it, you would see this diagram, which is like a blown up version. I, I like to say it's like a silicon sandwich. So we know that when solar panels create electricity, but how do they actually do that? So if you zoom in here, you can think of it, if, if you're familiar with the basic principle that, you know, electricity flows between positive and negative poles. So you, you need a positive and negative to, to have something happen. Um, it's, it's a similar thing here where within here, there's, la there's two layers of silicon. 
There's an N type, which is a negatively, uh, negatively charged layer. There's a P type, which is a positively charged layer. And what happens is when electricity hits, uh, sorry, when sunlight hits the top layer, it causes those electrons to move. And then you'll see a depletion layer, which is basically where you can wire things out and have that electricity move in the direction you need it to be like in in a series towards your house or something like that. So um, picture a little sandwich, two layers, sunlight hits it and it causes electrons to move and those layers direct it in the way it needs to go. Sort of the simplest way. There's a lot of videos on this if people are interested. So then what exactly, this is sort of just visualizing again what I just said. Solar panels are made of solar cells. When sunlight hits the cell, electrons are knocked off and then they flow through the material. There's two main types of solar panels out there right now. Um, there are, you know, dozens of different ways to make solar panels, but the, the two that you see on homes are polycrystalline, which I'll try to show you guys this. This is a little polycrystalline cell. I don't know if you can see it on my camera, but polycrystalline is multiple crystals. And actually, Baron, I feel like this is the point of the workshop where your daughter was like, your name's Crystal. And I was like, I know. Um, she was like, I can't believe it. So like, what, a, what a coincidence. It was so funny. Um, but that basically just means that it's multiple silicon crystals fused together. This tends to be um, like a, a more affordable, cheaper solar panel, but also less efficient. So I will show you, this is just a picture of, of one that you can see. This is a really small one. Um, you'll see here, just a, a quick demonstration. You, again, usually if this was in person, I, I would have you guys try it, but um, I'm using a multimeter just to measure voltage. And you can see that um, I, I have my uh, different pins on the connectors and it's going from zero to point, point 0.18 volts, which is not a lot, but I'm just sitting by the window. And that's literally, these pieces are literally all you need to generate the electricity. Then it, it's sort of up to you to wire it in the way that you need, need it to be. The, the only math you need to know with uh, solar design or the main math that you need to know is power equals current times voltage. So if you have a 10 watt solar panel, let's say, it might be two amps and five volts. It's, it's literally that simple. Um, when, I, when I found that out, I was like, oh, I can do this. Like, this is, this is really easy. So you can sort of figure out, like, you know, we design products for phones. We can figure out, okay, we need this current and this voltage to support a phone and then work backwards to figure out how big the solar panel needs to be. There's also monocrystalline panels, which is honestly um, more, more common because they're higher efficiency. So monocrystalline panels tend to be like 20 to 22% efficient at converting sunlight into electricity, which I, I have some, sometimes I feel like people are like, that's not that much. And I was like, 20% of sunlight to me sounds like a lot. Like, I think that's super, super impressive, but that number will keep, will keep going up. Polycrystalline tends to be like 16% or less, which that's a big reason why more people are jumping onto mono um, versus poly. I showed this picture before, but monocrystalline cells tend to be really, um, you can see this like, it's very matte blue because it's a single crystal. You don't see those little jagged edges. And then I personally like to use um, solar cells that have their, um, you, you saw me break that other polycrystalline one. Monocrystalline, some companies make them with back sheets so that you can see I bent this, but it actually is staying together. So th things like that are making solar panels a little more durable and long lasting. Okay, so, oh, and I wanted to show you guys a picture. This is actually, um, this is actually a prototype of a new solar panel we're working on, but you can kind of see that it, they're, they look completely black. So we only work with monocrystalline actually. You can see the backs too, how they all connect. Cool. So I know we've covered a lot of information in, in half an hour. So how do these little pieces actually become something useful? So if you look at a solar array, or if you see solar panels on a house, if you look closer, you can see these solar cells. Um, the, the solar cells, if you see these lines right here, those are like soldering lines, like uh, wires. 
it's, it's called tinning, but like wires that connect all of the cells together. And it, it sounds almost too simple to be true, but you basically can add up as many solar cells as you need to get to the amount of power that your application is. So um, for houses, you like you can easily add another solar panel if you needed to. It's very modular. That was something I really appreciated about solar design. So I'll show you guys a specific example too. So I showed you the picture before where I was only measuring one of these. Here's a picture of me measuring four across. Um, and you can see that the voltage is much higher than it was before, 0.68. And literally all I did was stack the cells on top of each other so that the positive and negative um, connectors were touching. Um, and it's, all, it's already adding up. So you can kind of imagine if you needed five volts, you would just keep adding them. And then of course they don't have to be touching each other like that. That's where you would add wiring to make it the shape or the proportions that you need. So, um, I feel like I'm gonna I'm gonna take a a quick water break. <laughs> this is great, Crystal. I'm yeah. Uh... It's like a, <laughs> and, and honestly, I, I feel like you know there's so there's so much detail you could go into, but this is this is an intro. So no, um, no, no, no. This is perfect. I yeah. I'm I'm recalling how good you are with your visuals at um, <laughs> thank you illustrating thank you. these concepts. I, I love it. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm on the edge of my seat. I've been learning. Oh so much. my gosh. <laughs> good. Um, so there are a couple options. So so now I'll kind of talk maybe a little bit more uh, like in a more practical context. So let's say. Let's pretend I owned a house in New York, which would be amazing. I don't, I live in an apartment, but let's say I did. Um, I would have two options. If I wanted solar panels on my roof, I could decide, do I want my solar panels to be connected to the grid or do I want them to be connected to a battery? And there is sort of a hybrid in between. So um, I think a common misconception is that most solar panels today are actually connected to the electrical grid. So um, solar panels, like I showed you in that other diagram, will only create electricity when sunlight hits it. So if I had solar panels on my roof and I was connected to the grid at night, I would be using the grid's electricity because I didn't have a battery backup. Um, and this is very, very common today. There's a lot of, um, in New York, there's a lot of um, attractive laws um, for why you should connect to the grid because you can actually make money on the on the electricity you produce but don't use. It's called net metering. Um, the other option is battery storage, which I'm sure you guys have all seen on the news with Tesla and storage, but um, you could get Tesla batteries or any type of solar company's batteries installed at, typically in your garage and then your solar panels can store their energy in the batteries and then that can power your house. The the kind of funny thing here that I always mention is that solar. Actually, I didn't I didn't actually ask you guys. Um, oops. Solar panels. Do you guys think they produce AC or DC energy? Barrett, you might know this because mm -hmm. you're building a solar setup. <laughs> yeah. I don't know this. Anything. I want to say. Direct. Maybe? Direct. Yeah, direct is right. So if you if you think, I think a good way to think about that is like when I think of alternating current, like typically something is spinning to make that happen because you're going positive, negative, literally positive, negative. Um, uh, solar panels are direct current. Um, and I think what's what gets funny about this is that your home, all of your home appliances and your home, the grid kind of integrated into your home is alternating current. So we actually need to do the opposite of like the AC adapter and every solar installation has an inverter. So you have to invert the, the DC power from your solar panels to match the AC power that your house runs on. So like your fridge, for example, plugs directly into the wall. So it runs on AC energy. So you, you're, it needs to be AC in your house. Um, when I, when I, I, I think that's funny cause it's like, power conversion inception where you have solar panels that are DC, you invert them to AC in your house, then you plug your computer in and it converts it back to DC, like for your computer or your phone. So. No, so. Our, we're, we're doing that work. 
actually, um, you know, I was just getting texts from Mark saying, yeah, I think I'm going to schedule the, the DC inverter work or the, the inverter work um, today or tomorrow. So yeah, we're dealing with that right now. And actually yes. one of our uh, um, team members, our David uh, Gibbs is uh, creating a, a company called Solar Seed that, that deals with this issue and makes it easier for yeah. our, uh, more people to access the energy by creating a, a better in inverter. So yeah, it is. Yeah, it is a little complicated, and we're we're actually lucky because for our small small panels that we make, um, our output is um, usually a USB port, so it's it's DC, so I don't have to invert anything. But but if you if we wanted to make it possible for you to like plug your computer in with like the pronged power cord, we would need to invert it in there. But it, it honestly, you do lose efficiency too. So for our small applications, right. it really doesn't make sense. But if we made a big right. one, then, then it could make sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you, you could have, you could have batteries, batteries again, are DC energy. So even, even the batteries need to <laughs> need to invert, which is kind of crazy. Um, and then just to sort of um, start <laughs> to wrap things up, there's a lot of really interesting solar and design applications happening in the world. I'll, I'll talk about a few of them just to, just to end on, on an inspirational note. So these are two of my favorites. This is a solar panda um, rendering for a like solar panda field being built out in China, which is amazing. Um, th this is a solar Mickey Mouse, which is actually, I think, outside of, um, outside of Disney World in Orlando that you can see when you fly in. Um, and that's actually been there for, I think, at least six or seven years for, for quite a long wow. time. Um, wow. This is a project that I, that I found online, which is a solar, a solar light up necklace. This one is pretty silly. This is a solar bikini that someone made. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll point out about this one is that you can see that these solar panels are quite different than the ones I showed you guys. They're organic solar panels, which we didn't really talk about in this talk, but it's, it's a different type of solar panel that... Um, is flexible, tends to be less efficient, but has really interesting applications. And then you'd be surprised, there are a lot of retail companies that are some of the biggest solar developers in the country, Target being one of them. You can't see the roof of Target, but a lot of their Target um, warehouses have solar panels on top with this bullseye design. Um, and we didn't talk about financing, but with, um, with all the government incentives and net metering, you can actually... Um, start to make money with your solar investment um, after you pay off the initial installation. If your state has net metering, they'll start paying you for the extra energy that you create. And you can you can tell that a lot of retail businesses are starting to do that because it like financially makes a lot of sense for them. And then just, just a few more. Um, this is actually a uh, Tommy Hilfiger project where they had these solar panels um, in jackets and I believe there were power banks in the pocket. These are solar bricks. I believe this is in Germany. Um, you might have seen some like solar sunflower shapes in parks, or I think you can even get these in your backyard. This one is just super silly solar solar panels, <laughs> solar panels on your head. And then um, this is a question that that I get a lot, so I started adding it to my talk. But you know, practically, what could you do to go solar if you don't want to design? If you, not everyone wants to design their own panel, so what can you actually do? And we, we started compiling this sort of list for people where if you're any, any person in the world, there's sort of five ways to practically go solar. One is residential rooftop. Two is commercial, like Target, if you, if you own like a commercial property. Um, three is community solar, which I actually subscribe to, where you can, um, you can subscribe to be part of a solar farm happening locally. So I subscribe to a solar farm happening in New York and I actually get a discount on my electricity bill because I'm helping that project happen. So I, I basically get a cut, a cut of the savings, which is great. Um, there's personal solar, which is solar products like the ones that we make. And then there's also energy service providers, uh, energy service companies, also known as ESCOs. Um, this one's probably the most confusing, but if you've ever seen like Green Mountain Energy at a farmer's market or like outside of a Whole Foods with a table, like asking you to switch to 100% clean energy. That's what that is. And that one that's is a great. little, sorry, I missed that. 
That's what we do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what you would. Yeah, that one is a little bit different. I believe you you might have to pay a little bit more, but then you're you're sort of like creating more demand for clean exactly. energy on the grid where it's not exactly. like coming to your house, but you're paying for it to be out there. So yep. if, if you're totally um, if if you're lost and you're not sure where to start, these are sort of five ways to to jump in. Um, that is all I have for the presentation. Um, thank you so much. If, if anyone wants to follow Group Hug, we're Group Hug Solar on Instagram, grouphugsolar.com. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Crystal, I got so many questions, but I'm gonna <laughs> see if there's other folks that can jump in. Um, I have questions about uh, the solar, uh, questions about um, your your company and, and where you wanna go, but um, I'll, I'll bite my tongue and, and see if there's other folks. This is the time now. Um, if, uh, if anybody wants to um, throw out questions through um, uh, the comments channel, we can see those and uh, would love to um, answer anything that you guys might have. Um, um, and so Maite is going to help us with this, but I see the, uh, a couple of them. Um, are starting to pop in. Um, do you want to go ahead and take these then? Um, my take on yes. So we're going to start with Kaylee Chin's question. She says she lives in a very foggy area. So, how well would solar panels work and would they produce enough energy for charging her phone? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So, um, solar panels can work in partial cloudiness um it, it's really we've done a bunch of testing on this it's really like you need i mean i'll say direct sunlight is the most efficient way to charge that's that's ideal but you can charge in in um foggy conditions but it will take a longer time to charge um because if you think about it when sun when bright sunlight hits it's creating more electricity at once and when it's not as bright it sort of trickle creates electricity um, especially with small um, small chargers. So Kaylee, I would say that yes, it would work for you, but it might take a, a couple extra hours because of the foggy conditions. Gotcha. Um, talking about your product specifically, does the solar panel have its own battery or is it directly connecting to charge whatever mobile device it is that you're charging? Yeah, that's a good question. It has a battery built inside. So like the way, so I'm, I'm sitting at my desk, so I have, I have one right here. Um, <laughs> it basically just is there all the time, and then when I'm ready to charge my phone, I can just plug it in. It doesn't. It can be day or night. Awesome. Um, next question: We have Brianna Chin asking, "How can the Group Hug charger contribute to renewable energy transition from fossil fuels to clean energy?" Yeah, ooh, that's a big question. Um, I I honestly see the role of Group Hug being more um, more in education than than anything else. I think I'm really passionate about education and taking complicated things and making them easier to understand. Um, you know, one small solar panel is not going to charge your entire house, but it is like an entry point into getting you to think about and use solar in a hands-on way. And then we're actually um, one of the things we're doing now is building out a network where. Um, one of the most common questions we get is, I did this, now what do I Now what do? I do? Or like, I live here, now what can I do? So we're building out a network of information where we can guide people to next steps they can take. So I hope that our small charger is a catalyst for people to keep going. Like Barrett mentioned Sela, like Sela's growing up with a solar panel. Like I, <laughs> I hope that that makes her view energy a little differently than if she never had it. So that, that's sort of how I think about it. Yeah. Yeah, starting the conversation and making sure it continues. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's really like, um, it's it can be tricky, I would say, at least personally, like being creative and being a designer and trying to figure out where you can make an impact. And I that was something that was tough for me in the beginning, just realizing like you're just not going to solve everything. And you just have to pick one thing that you're good at and just try to do it. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we actually try to keep that scope pretty small that like we are the catalyst we're not gonna we're not gonna start doing rooftop installations you know but we can help people get there yeah you can facilitate yeah yeah okay 
Um, next question is by Bella. At the end of their life, can solar panels be disassembled and recycled? Um, they can, they can. I will say the United States is a little behind. There, there are more systems like that set up in Europe. Um, like for our particular panel, we'll take back any solar panel because a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of solar panels are designed pretty modularly, which is very useful because it means you can sort of separate the electronics and, and separate, um, separate the pieces and put them back into their, into their streams. Um, I, I, it is, I don't want to, I don't want to like gloss over that though. I think solar panel recycling is something that the U S is going to need to tackle more aggressively. I think right now it's sort of up to like most products, it's up to the consumer to figure it out, which, you know, the burden, the burden should never be on them. Companies should take them back. That's not quite happening yet. No. Gotcha. Yeah, other countries are doing a really good job. Um, my parents live in Chile, so I've been in quarantining there, and they're doing really great stuff with renewable energy. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so we've had a lot of diversity in different, um, we have from forest areas to um, we're really close to um, Antarctica, so it gets really cold down there. We have deserts, um, so in the deserts, they're covering so much area with solar panels it's really oh, wow. exciting to be growing that like network and that grid work yeah that is cities. exciting and then i saw bella's question about like uh the issues of mining and copper and i mm -hmm. i think it's a great question because i think it's it is um it is in some respect related because there is so much metal and precious metals that goes into making not only solar panels but electronics like this is my psa never ever throw away electronics there's gold in them there are gold there's gold in there there's silver in there there's copper in there like there is so much that goes into those things that they can be recycled it's just not it's just not happening and i think if if we had a better system for doing that you know like um rec like <laughs> i don't i can't Barrett, you would know this better than me, but there's not, I don't think there's a stream for like recycled copper because like recycled I, I, copper I make, wire. I make, I make like an annual trip full of old appliances that have broken to Best Buy because yeah. Best Buy has that e-waste recycling center. And, you know, they look yeah. at me like crazy as I come in with these wires and everything. Yeah. But, but it's the easiest spot for me to get to versus like waiting in the long e-waste recycling line, which are awesome. I love that are people that are that committed, but yeah. I think it's because people don't know that Best Buy has a really good take back program that allows you to, so that's what I I use. That's great, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, we used to say at Sustainable Works, like if it has a plug, don't put it in the trash, right? No. Like anything yeah. with a plug should go into e-waste re re yeah. reclamation. A hundred percent, because like there's so much precious stuff in there yeah, that can be exactly. reused, and I, I think that's actually if, if I flip it a little bit and think about it as like a product designer. If you're designing a product, you go through the process of like specking what materials you want. So I think what's great about what you guys are doing. If I was like, oh, I'm going to design a toy, I'm going to spec recycled plastic, which is like exactly. becoming a thing now. You can't yep. spec recycled copper wire. Like it's like, it's <laughs> it's just not a thing that like the supply chain is ready for. It's not like a material like that. It should be. Um, and I think, you know, I think part of it is like the behavior that we're used to. And part of it is that companies need to take responsibility. And, you know, it's, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it is about money because if it costs more money to get the metals back through recycling, then companies just don't do it, right? So they kind of have to be forced to. Right, right. Because we're not paying true costs for. Because we're not paying true costs, exactly. You know, like the what is the, the cost to the polluting our water and the cost of uh, polluting our air? I have and, to. And like, and mining to an extent that it's so dangerous yeah. and horrible, like. Exactly. We, there's copper in the world. We, we really don't need to be mining it that much, but it's, yeah. Yeah. I have to jump in and ask what it's like uh, uh, 
as an entrepreneur, you know, going on Shark Tank and then working with uh, Mark Cuban. What was what was that like? Give us a little. Yes, insight. well, Shark Tank was was very nerve wracking but exciting. I think it was one of those moments where it actually happened just like months after we launched our Kickstarter. So it was very early. It was very very early. Um, but it was one of those things where like if someone emails you and is like, do you want to apply to be on Shark Tank? I was like, sure. Like I'll just do, I'll just do it. Like what's the worst? The worst that can happen is that they'll embarrass me, I guess, on TV, which I was like, okay. Um, so I did it. And um, Mark has been a really great partner. He's, um, he's very, uh, very helpful and like very relaxed. Um, he always, he always says like, tell me bad news first, basically. And then good news, good news second. But he's, al he's always super helpful. And I, I think what some people don't realize is that every shark sort of has a whole team around them. So he has you know, an accountant and a law team that you can email and ask questions. And that's been really helpful. Awesome. What's next for, for group hug? Like what can you uh, share that um, we can look forward to? Yes. So it's funny because it, it's been two years technically, I guess, since the Kickstarter, which simultaneously feels like a long time and like no time at all um, because we didn't actually start shipping um, until last summer. So we, we've actually only had products for a year. Um, so I, I think um, I know Barrett, we kind of talked about this. I think for us, we're really just like trying to focus on selling and perfecting the product we have before we open up to other SKUs and other items um, and like building, building a community. I, I will say we're, we're working on a different version of the solar charger that has this herringbone pattern oh, sort of in the same, in the same size, just leaning into the design aspect of group hug. So where we will probably launch it on Kickstarter again. Awesome, <laughs> since, awesome. since we already have a community there and I think Kickstarter exactly. is such a great place. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry, Brooklyn in the background here. Oh, that's but, okay. <laughs> uh, no, we, we uh, have seen um, other companies doing the same thing, like uh, Peak Design and Manual that just, you know, take advantage of uh, the early adopter excitement from Kickstarter, but then yeah. you also have that great community of folks that are ready to um, support you uh, on your next endeavor. So yeah, uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, cool. yeah, and it's so nice to get the early feedback from people who are interested in, in what you're doing. And like, I honestly couldn't imagine not doing that now. Like, imagine making a product and just launching it directly into retail. It would be <laughs> like that's scary. <laughs> that's terrifying. Like, yeah. you don't even know what people yeah. think or like right. how many yeah. you're going to sell. So yeah. we have to buy a mold, right? So like, yeah. you know, yours is assembled. So um, then add like uh, a mold on top of that if if you. Uh, want to go into production. So yeah, it's, it's, I think um, uh, we're hoping it's a, as helpful as it is for us as it has been for you. So yeah, uh, I, we actually have one mold. Um, I, when we were designing it, I was like, we need to have as little mold as possible because it's so expensive. Um, I was like, I don't like, I'm not going to shell out the money for a mold. It, um, Baron, you can look at it while you're at home. It's, um, one mold for the little uh, plastic pieces that diffuse the LEDs. Ah, gotcha. They're like they're like little pegs that sit in. It's the same mold, just I all see. three of them. I see, I see, I see. It's yeah. on the back there. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. That's it. That Interesting. is it. Very cool. Um, Crystal, this has been awesome. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for doing another workshop. I, I learned something now on the third time I've watched it. <laughs> um, no I, problem. Uh, My pleasure. Yeah, this has been awesome. Um, I hope uh, uh, we can stay connected and, and um, look forward to seeing. Oh, I, I know. Have you been able to do any more exhibition work like the solo cat since people have started coming back? Or is that now we just, just yeah, we, we just started we just started to sort of reach out to people again maybe like a month ago but it that that business totally died in covid for for very good reason but we're starting right. to like reach out again to see if anyone's if anyone's ready we did do one i didn't include a picture we did one custom solar over the pandemic which was a solar turtle 
So like the that's turtle awesome. shell was a solar panel. Oh, it, was, it was really cute. Oh, that's awesome. On an actual turtle? Oh, no, no, no. It was, uh, we could, kind of like I feel like work. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that to yeah. a turtle, but um, it was actually in like a reptile and amphibian museum, which was funny, um, in Iowa, um, funny how they found us. So we, we developed a solar turtle for their window and it, it actually powers the turtle lamp, which is cool. Oh, wow. So Very cool. cool. We're in Iowa. I'm in one of those flyover states I grew up um, in. Oh my gosh, I can't remember right now. <laughs> I forget. I, I actually like, I, it, it's it's sad because like if it were non pandemic I absolutely would have been there oh, like for for like right. weeks like developing it with them right. but we had to do it all over Zoom but one day I'll go I'll go visit and all check right. out the channel yeah. <laughs> yeah sounds good awesome well Crystal thank you so much um, thanks to everybody that uh, that tuned in uh, whether you're listening live or on a recording or a podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, you can, we'll, we'll be turning this uh, into uh, a video resource and a podcast and you can find it on our website, circular economy, mfg.com forward slash resources. Um, and so I, I hope you guys take a look at Crystal's work and that you found um, her talk informative and um, we'll have to have you come out to Governor's Island once we're doing our solar installation. I, I would love to, I'd love to. Yeah, we're gonna try, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, but we're gonna try and do a live stream while we're installing cool. the solar. So yeah. uh, it'll be kind of fun to, to see. So cool. anyway, Maite, anything um, else? I miss anything? No, thank you so much, Crystal, for being here, for teaching me so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's been great. Thank you so much. You're welcome, right. have a good night, you guys. All right. Thank Thanks, Crystal. Bye. Right. Bye.